Um, this is a, a, a paper I put together for the Western Conference, and unfortunately, the cancellation of that happened too quickly, so we couldn't really put together an online version of that. So I'm going to talk about it now. And i also like to say thank you, everybody, for uh, re-electing me this year. So the first part of my talk is going to be about building a custom space weather dashboard uh, with a little twist. Um, and uh, so let me just go to the next one here. Okay. So most mornings, I, uh, as soon as I fire up my computer, uh, I check spaceweather.com and the NOAA Space Weather Enthusiast Dashboard, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, just to review the latest space weather conditions. Uh, and then right after that, I go to XKCD to see what the latest comic is. But uh, anyhow, <laughs> um, I began exploring the area at the bottom of the space weather page on NOAA called Products and Data. Um, and I found there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, I think this is true of a lot of government organizations, right? They're under, they are required by their funding to share their data. So they have a bunch of stuff at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. And then this got me thinking about making a custom dashboard so that I would not have to go to multiple sites to get this data all at once. So there you go. So this is spaceweather.com. Hopefully some of you have looked at this at least once in a while. Um, this is produced by uh, Tony Phillips uh, over in Bishop, California, which is near the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And he puts together this every day. It shows you how many sunspots there are, um, what the sunspot number is, how many days it's been, um, and general other things, especially aurora. Uh, at the bottom of the page, he has a bunch of stuff about um, uh, potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, which talks about, you know, the latest observations and sightings of asteroids, um, which can be interesting, especially when, uh, you know, if you check it every day, all of a sudden you'll notice one that, like, came uh, a tenth of a distance between here and the moon and is 10 meters across, and it only popped up the day you saw it. Uh, that's a little worrying sometimes. Anyhow, this is a great source of information about the sun and, uh, you know, the X has the x-ray, the solar wind data, and the sunspot number. Um, this is the Space Weather Prediction Center at NOAA, and this is their Space Weather, weather Enthusiast Dashboard. So they have different dashboards for different um, businesses. There's a whole aviation dashboard, one for people who are all about satellites, um, you know, just to compile the information in a way that's of interest to you. And this, um, this uh, was, you can see up here, was February 15th. Um, and the x-ray flux really was off the scale low because we're in the middle of solar low. If you go there now, it's, it's like hovering down here on the very bottom of the scale. But at that point in time, it really was off the scale low. And it has the geo, this has the uh, x-ray flux, protons, geomagnetic activity, and the forecast for the geomagnetic activity, which is probably about where our weather forecasting was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. They could maybe kind of tell you what it might do later today and maybe tomorrow, but the third day one is not so good usually. <laughs> Nothing against them, it's just that the models don't exist and the information we're still learning. So I mentioned that at the bottom of, the, at the bottom of this page, and this I, I, I just, you know, zoom this up because it would be too small to see on the screen. There's a whole bunch of stuff, including this products and data section. And so you can go directly to a, a number of different things. There are, there are report, forecasts, reports, all kinds of things. And then down here, oh, here you can see the other dashboards listed. And right here you can see data access. Um, and so if you go there, um, this is what you get. You get this data service and they offer data of different kinds of things in a number of different formats. Um, uh, JSON, which if you're not familiar with, is a sort of a shorthand uh, JavaScript object notation, I believe is what it's called. There is some that's straight text. Um, and so some data is available only in one format. Sometimes it's available in multiple formats. But anyhow, it's all there. So I was going to put together, I had seen articles in magazines and online about coding your own dashboard, um, you know, basically either for Windows or um, for Linux. And um, I thought that was a pretty cool idea. And um, 
and uh, you know something that I could put together so that I could have all my information in one screen. But I'm old enough to remember when a dashboard had actual gauges with moving pointers and not virtual bar graphs. I'm sure some of you share that. Uh, <laughs> the dashboard on your car was actually gauges with meters and pointers. And this is not as crazy an idea as you might think. I found some one milliamp panel meters on all electronics for $3.50 a piece in quantity of eight. So it's not super expensive or anything to do it this way. Um, and I thought it would be fun. I, I, um, I thought it would be a good way to learn something about Linux and Python and the Raspberry Pi to do this. So here's a little side note about display power. I had years and years ago, if any of you were at the first Owens Valley uh, conference that we did, I had built um, uh, an LED bar graph style display to do similar things. Um, at the time, I was going to monitor several VLF stations on different bar graphs. Um, and here's an interesting thing to think about is that if you have six bar graphs um, with 10 LEDs per bar and they're at full scale, you end up drawing 600 milliamps of power to display those six items. Whereas six of these one MA meters only draw six milliamps. So that's a factor of a hundred different. And don't even talk about the power required to display on a monitor. So anyhow, the other thing is that some MCUs can't really drive an LCD directly, certainly not that many all at once, but pretty much any processor can drive a one milliamp meter. Um, uh, and in fact, if you search around, I'm sure you could find 100 microamp meters, so the, the numbers even get a little better. But if you use a 3.3 volt processor, which is really common right now in microprocessors, um, and with PWM outputs and a 3.3K ohm resistor, you get a 1 milliamp full scale. So that's pretty easy to hook up. Um, now, I, my first idea was to use an ARM processor eval board from Texas Instruments. It had enough PWM outputs and it had an ethernet port. Um, I'm a pretty experienced embedded microprocessor software guy and hardware guy. And so I thought that that would be a good way to go. But I got frustrated with the network uh, access, the internet access support tools were not very good. So then, and that was, so I sort of hit a dead end with that. I didn't have enough time to really dig into it. So then I discovered the Pi Servo hat from Adafruit. Uh, hopefully those of you out there who are familiar with the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino know about Adafruit. Uh, they're a small company in New York uh, who have all kinds of great little hardware widgets uh, at very, very good prices. Um, and I you know, highly uh, recommend you go there, adafruit.com. Um, and the Pi Servo hat, which is, is an interesting thing, which is, um, it's, oh, let me back up here. Um, the Pi Servo hat, they use it for controlling um, model RC car servo motors um, for, uh, um, you know, to, to do animations and things like that. Um, so that, which is kind of cool. Um, and, but it turns out they're just a PWM output. Um, and so it has 16 PWM outputs from this board, which plugs onto the top of a Raspberry Pi. Um, and that sort of woke up my idea. Oh, well, I could do, I knew that the Raspberry Pi had good, uh, you know, network support. So the Raspberry Pi, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it was developed in the UK originally to promote teaching of computer science in schools worldwide. And many millions of them have been sold since. I have a few of them in the office even right at the moment. Um, there have been several versions since the original Raspberry Pi Model A was released in 2013. Um, I bought for this project a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B, which at the time was one of the most more recent ones. Basically has an ARM processor running at 1.2 gigahertz. It has a gigabyte of RAM, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and USB ports. 
and then the code is actually on um, uh, it, the code is actually on a um, SD card, a little micro SD card. Um, it's kind of shocking how much data there you can fit on a micro SD card. Uh, as an S, as a side note, I heard about this idea of being able to you put one if if you you can put all of Wikipedia onto a 128 gig SD card, uh, which I which is not that expensive. I put all of Wikipedia on an SD card and then I have it in my phone. So even offline, I can access Wikipedia, uh, which is great because I like to go camping. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so here's a picture of a Raspberry Pi card. Uh, uh, I can't remember. I think I got this picture off the Raspberry Pi site, but um, you can see here's the video interface. This is where you plug in speakers. Um, this uh, US micro USB is intended for powering the device. There's stacks of full-size uh, type A USB cards, uh, USB jacks over here, and this is the network jack. And then this spot here is where you plug on a, a hat, they call it. If you're, um, if you're familiar with the Arduino world, they would refer to it as a shield. Um, so I don't know why they decided on a hat, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, they didn't want to call it a shield, I guess. Um, and then as an aside, if you want to, you can hook a camera here, which is sort of an interesting idea. I have an idea for that. Um, so as I mentioned, the servo hat, it plugs onto the top on that connector. You get 16 uh, PWM outputs uh, tended to drive hobby or RC servos. Um, it's based on the uh, NXP PCA9685 chip, which is really intended to drive LEDs at variable brightness. And in fact, I've designed this chip into a couple of different products I've worked on since I discovered it, because it's a pretty cool part. Um, and the, the hat, all assembled circuit board is $17.50 from Adafruit. So that was a pretty good deal. And this is what it looks like. Um, here's the the guts of it, the chip that does all this, the magic. It has 16 PWM outputs and they have quite a bit of flexibility about the speed and alignment of the pulses and a whole bunch of other things. And um, this thing, these three pin headers are set up to power, to match um, servo pinout. Now, there's a, there's a disclaimer that if you're going to run high power servos and all that, that you probably want to power them some other way than through the center pins here. But um, this is certainly, um, you know, an adequate way to do small servos. Um, now they do have, and they have, uh, just also to support, they, they have this power input jack for your servo. So you can separate the Raspberry Pi's power from the servo power, which is probably a good idea. So here's, a, here's how the design works. Here's my architecture, I guess you'd say. Um, so I have the Raspberry Pi single board computer and the Adafruit Pi servo hat sitting on top of it. Um, I designed a little circuit board based on an um, a AC-DC module to provide um, five volts for the Raspberry Pi and um, a, uh, a 12 volt power for these uh, indicators, and I'll come to that in a minute. The signals from the servo go to a custom perf board I, just, I built, um, and that has some stuff on it here I'll talk about a little bit, but basically that takes all those connections from the servo connectors and, um, you know, splits them out into connectors for these meters and also drives the indicators. So, now I had to figure out what I wanted to display. I have room for six meters on the panel. So I had to kind of whittle it down to the things I really wanted to know. So here's what I have currently. Um, I have the sunspot number, um, which is a linear scale from zero to 250. And it's been at zero a lot lately. Like today, I think it's reading about 20. Um, uh, Another, the next one to it is solar flux units. If you're into ham radio and try to reach uh, distant places through, 
ionospheric propagation, then you might pay attention to this number. Uh, the SFUs are tell you um, how much X-ray, it, it's how much, what the radio flux is at um, 10 centimeters, uh, which is about 3,800. Um, yeah, it's in the three gigahertz range. So um, the K, the K, it's the next one I put up was the K index. Uh, um, this is again, something you might be aware of. It's the magnetic, uh, how unsettled the magnetic um, field of the earth is at the moment. And this is a three hour window. That's um, the KP is uh, calculated on. You also might be familiar with the A index, which is the basically the K index, but for the whole day instead. They sort of give a rating for the whole day. Um, the next one is the X-ray flux, which as I mentioned in the earlier one was zero for a while, but it's near, you know, it's starting to come up off the peg as we get a few, uh, few sunspots. And then the last two have to do with the solar wind. Um, solar wind speed which is uh, on a linear scale from zero to 1600 kilometers a second, which is pretty fast. Um, and the density, which is um, from zero to 60 uh, particles per cubic centimeter, so which is not very dense. Um, if you think about 60 electrons in a cubic centimeter, that's even at its highest density is like not many particles, but that's the way the solar wind works. Oh, I want to mention, so these are all linear scales with the exception of the X-ray flux. Uh, which is, of course, covers a wide range of uh, um, uh, quite well, covers a wider range of magnitudes. So the meter scales, obviously, they came with a meter scale which was zero to one milliamp um, when I bought them. Uh, some of the data, like the index or the K, uh, sunspot number, K index are linear. X-ray flux, as I just mentioned, covers several orders of magnitude and is usually plotted logarithmically. So I searched around. I'd heard about this for a while back. It's a piece of software simply called Meter, uh, from and it's a meter scale drawing program from Ton Software. Uh, he actually also has some uh, filter design software and things like that, which are inexpensive and very useful. I if, I recommend you check out his site. Uh, it's quite good. So you can get the free basic version, or there's a full featured version for fifty to five dollars. I decided to spring for the extra money since I was going to do six meters, um, and to help support him a little bit. So here's an example of a close-up of the X-ray flux meter. Now, even though it's a, I decided to do the logarithmic conversion in the software. So it, basically, what I've done is it's linearly by magnitude. Right, so this is 10 to the minus eight watts per square meter, and this is 10 to the minus two watts per square meter. Um, so when you get up to this range, that's a pretty intense X-rays. These are all, by the way, these scales are all based on the NOAA scales, uh, which I uh, I pointed out on the space weather dashboard. I tried to align everything as much as I could uh, with their scales, so it would all it would all make sense. Well, let me just go back to that previous one here. One thing too is the um, this meter drawing program is very nice in that basically you take a few measurements. Uh, these dots here are the mounting holes for the scale. Um, there's usually a couple of small screws if you look at a, a meter. Uh, this is this this point is the center of the meter pivot, the where the uh, arm on the meter pivots. And then you can choose these radii. Um, you can have multiple scales per uh, per meter scale. So you could, um, you know, you could have a couple of ranges, or you could, um, for instance, you might have. Um, in this case, I use color, but you might have like uh, I think on the K index one also. There's the you know you, there's different ways of stating that, and so you could have. Uh, you know, you might have, a perfect example would be like, you might have degrees F and degrees C, you know. So anyhow, it's quite flexible. You can put the tech, all this text on there. It's great, great program. Little sales pitch there. <laughs> um, so here's the tricky part um, for the data sources. While I found all these data sources, each one of them is really unique. Um, some of them are plain text. Some of them are JavaScript object notation. 
Um, the formats are all different, even amongst the plain text and JSON. Um, not everything's available from the Space Weather Production Center. I tried to, as much as possible, find the actual primary data source, not the aggregated data. So in other words, spaceweather.com is great, but he, that's not a primary source. I actually hunted around and found like the official sunspot number data source and used that instead. Um, the data is also uploaded at different rates by their sources. So as I mentioned, the K index is calculated every three hours at NOAA and the A index only once per day. And the, but the X-ray flux is once a minute. You, they get a data point from a satellite that gives the x-ray flux. So I had to figure out a way to sort of deal with all of that. Um, and basically what I did was I don't, I don't check the K index just every three hours. I update it about every 15 minutes. And that makes it a little more robust for, um, uh, you know, network failures. You know, you might, you might go out and ask for the data and not get it right away. Uh, that sort of thing. So, um, but the x-ray flux I do get once a minute. That, that's sort of the fastest thing that I go out and get. So, um, now I had to go out and learn Python. <laughs> um, I'm an ex a pretty experienced C and assembly language programmer, but I have no experience with Python. So luckily there's plenty of online learning resources, uh, tutorials and, uh, you know, how to get started sort of resources. And luckily the servo hat came with uh, a demo program that I was able to use as a starting point, right? A, a simple example is a huge step to get, to get you off the, you know, off the ground with something like this. And, you know, I took a very one step at a time thing. I started with one simple data source. I looked at all the ones and said, okay, I think I can untangle this one pretty easily and put that one up on the meter. Um, and then as I got each one working, I added, uh, I added more. And also what happened was as I would run this for days at a time, um, different types of errors would arise in the data that was, that I requested. So, um, you know, I would add in things to, to, um, filter out the errors or deal with them in a graceful way rather than just having it crash back to Linux. So here's a photo of the sort of finished thing and the space weather um, dashboard is this bottom one. The, the one above that is um, my SAM 3 geomagnetic field monitor, which I bought from Whit Reeve. It comes in a, um, a nice little plastic box, but it wasn't really working with my uh, rack setup. You can see this is a, uh, you know, I went with rack width panels. So I repackaged it into this. Um, and I used up one of the eight meters I bought uh, for the K index output of that board. Um, the, the K index was not eight when I took this picture. I, I had been working on the system and it was, thought it was eight that, at that moment in time. It settled down after it had been shut, shut off for a while. So after it had been running for a while, I mean. Um, and by the way, I, I was too cheap to buy a rack. So this is actually a rack-like object made out of two by fours. So, but the spacing is great and it works good. The two by fours will handle the screws from the shelf brackets and the front panels just fine. Um, so here you can see sunspot number, um, uh, the solar flux units, um, the K index, the X-ray flux. Um, I since then modified this a little bit to make the, it look a little nicer like that. The solar wind speed and the solar density. Now, one thing I'll mention, um, oh, this is a power switch for the Raspberry Pi, which is hidden inside. I, I, since I was going old school with the meters, I also went old school with the indicators. And these are actual six volt pilot lights inside those like jeweled, old, old style jeweled holders, you know? So you can kind of get an idea of that on the green one. Uh, you can see the facet there lit up. And I just thought it went with the style. Um, <laughs> certainly not practical because I had to add another power supply and add drivers that could turn these, uh, lamps on, uh, you know, so I had to add power transistors to turn those on. I couldn't hook them straight to the, uh, Raspberry Pi and Servo Hat. 
Um, here's what the inside looks like, a top view. So you can see the backs of the meters and the wiring and the wiring's all coming in here. Um, and then the, these are the pilot lamps. And then this is uh, the Raspberry Pi stack with the Raspberry Pi hat on top. Um, this is the perf board that I designed. I'll talk about that in a minute. And this is my, uh, uh, you know, line supply, line power supply module, which I bought. Um, and basically it puts out, I think it puts out, I want to say nine volts and then I regulate it down to five for the Pi. Um, I think that's right. It might be six. Anyhow, um, it's been a little while since so I looked at it. And this object here, um, at the time, uh, I did not have um, a monitor that would work with, the monitor I was trying to use for development didn't have HDMI. It was an old one that I had laying around. So this is like a HDMI to VGA adapter. I don't, I don't need to use that anymore, but that's what that was. And you see the power cord coming out. Uh, and then here's a close up of the, of the perf board. And basically what I did, um, the meters aren't perfect. You know, they're plus or minus several percent, I think. Um, and so they needed calibration. And, and so what I did was rather than using a 3.3K ohm resistor, I used a 3K resistor and a small pot. I think it's a 1K trimmer to allow me to adjust the full scale on each one. Obviously you start by adjusting that one, um, you know, adjust this screw for the zero. Those of you who are familiar with analog meters, uh, you adjust the zero and then, uh, and then adjust these pots for full scale. And uh, I had a test routine built in there to do that. And then these are the transistors here that drive the, the three um, lamps. Uh, so um, pretty simple. I think I bought that perf board thing from Adafruit too when I bought everything else. So um, results. Uh, I'm really happy with the performance. Uh, the Raspberry Pi runs for weeks at a time uh, without trouble. Um, and it's nice, as I, it's nice to be able to just look over at the meters. I can literally lean back and see the meters and see what's going on. It's really great. Um, it's fun. I don't have to click on anything on the screen. I don't have to, whatever, interrupt whatever I'm doing on the computer. I can just go look at it. Um, the uh, the only problem I, I have, and this hasn't happened in a while, I've, I've mitigated most of the bad data issues, um, but the, the Pi runs for weeks without problems. Um, the only time it really shuts down is for power failures uh, anymore. Um, and uh, and then I have to restart it, uh, get everything going again. I have not made it auto restart yet, which I certainly could do to run my application to drive the meters. I, I, at this point, I have it um, running to a KVM switch so that I can switch over and, and talk to the Pi through the keyboard and the screen. Um, and, you know, at this point, I'm still debugging. So I want to know what happened, what caused it to stop. Um, and so I haven't gone to the auto startup setup. Um, and uh, so here's some links to it. I will, I will say that I think um, for uh, one of my next steps is I, I want to go deeper into the um, Python and I want to do a visual uh, dashboard on the screen of the Raspberry Pi more as a educational experience than anything else. Uh, the Raspberry Pi has tons of capability, and I'm sure that I could make that happen in Python, and I know other people have done it. So uh, I'm leaving that as my next, uh, my next learning experience with uh, the Raspberry Pi and this object. Um, here's a few links. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, spaceweather.com, the Space Weather Prediction Center. Oh, here's one something I will say. I think that this link might be wrong now. They just... Space Weather Prediction just changed their maps on their websites. Don't you hate it when they do that? You have a bookmark set and they go and change how they've structured the website. There's no difference in anything that you can see, but they change the addresses. And that's a continuing, I haven't had that problem much with the data, but I have had at least one instance where the source I'm using for data went away and I had to go find it again. Um, so, 
Okay, so before I move on to super sin, are there any questions about the um, uh, about um, what I just showed you so far? I'm having trouble seeing my chat window. Where is that gone? Uh, I got uh, one uh, from Elena. Um, good free place for start Python is Coursera. Python for everyone presented by University of Michigan. Yep. Um, I don't see any specific uh, questions uh, yet on okay. the chat. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, if, if you have data that you like to look at a lot, um, it, you know, might think about doing something, you don't have to do it with meters, but definitely the idea of building your own dashboard is a, is a, is a great way to, you know, learn Python and maybe learn a little bit more about your computer if you want to. I, I do got uh, a couple questions coming in. Uh, Mike Ott, are you screen scraping or accessing a database? I'm, ex I'm accessing a database. Um, generally, the text I'm getting for is all either in text or JSON. Uh, I'm not trying to, like, pull the data out of an HTML uh, website. That, that changes even more frequently than the lower-level data. Okay. John McCullough, how much did all that cost? Oh, it wasn't much. I think the Raspberry Pi was $30. The Pi hat was, uh, was um, t under 20. Um, I'm going to say I had the meter, I had the panel, the meters and everything. It was, had to have been under $100, I think, um, to put that all together. All right. Okay. I think that's a all the questions for this section. Go okay, let, let me just uh, buzz on through and do the last part of this and talk about SuperSid. Um, as Rich mentioned, uh, for the last five years, uh, <laughs> Melinda, Melinda and Bill were excellent salespeople and they convinced me to take over the, the, the handling of SuperSid. Um, they have been um, testing and building and shipping those devices and, and Linda put together an excellent manual which I still have. Um, I don't know if y'all can see my picture too, but anyhow, she put together a whole notebook of how to do it, which I've just refined since. Uh, and it has been a great, um, you know, a fun thing to do. Not without its frustrations, of course, but uh, basically um, we buy, let me just talk about this for a minute. So let me back up just a skosh. What is super SID? So SID, SID is a sudden ionospheric disturbance, um, generally caused by solar flares, although there are a few other things which might cause solar, cause SIDs. Um, the tactic is to monitor VLF government transmitters around 25 kilohertz. Um, the United States has several in that uh, region scattered across the country. There are other countries have other ones as well. Um, you all may be familiar with WWVB, which is the time source at 60 kilohertz, while other countries have time broadcasts at lower frequencies, which you can pick up this way. A SuperSID is a loop antenna. We don't provide the antenna itself, but we provide a kit if you want to build one, uh, basically the wire and cable. Uh, a preamp, um, which is a single amplifier, single op amp design inside of a small round tin um, and then the software uh, which allows you to use a high def sound card you have to be able to sample in the u.s at least you have to be able to sample at 96 kilohertz to pick up the 25 and 26 kilohertz signals um, and then it, pre it presents it does two things one is it presents a live um, a live picture of the signal that's coming in as a spectrum. So if you you know you see the zero to forty eight kilohertz spectrum displayed on your screen, and then you you can designate certain signals as ones you want to track um, long term. So it will track the amplitude of a, a given transmitter, and then every day it will save a data file and if you want to upload the data file to the database which exists at Stanford. The system was originally designed by the Stanford Solar Center. Um, uh, Debbie Shearer and her team there um, who were part of the outreach and education group at Stanford. Um, they originally had a, 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 a single channel, very expensive SID receiver um, they were like thousands of dollars and they were hard to, hard to, um, you know, 
they were hard to manufacture. Then they came up with the idea of this idea, using a high def sound card and, and a simple preamp. And that has turned into a great uh, thing. It, they, we were able to, they were able to originally do it using students, I believe, uh, manufacture these things and ship them to um, educational uh, institutions all around the world. And um, then they got together with Sarah, probably, well, I want to say around 2013 or so. Um, and we took over the manufacturing and distribution of it. We got some money from Stanford to support that. Um, and then, as I said, Bill and Melinda Lord um, did that originally. And then my wife and I took it over eventually. Uh, it's pretty simple. I, um, there's a, a circuit board in there, which we have made um, about a, in a hundred at a time. And then all the other stuff is, you know, simple wires and cables. So um, I have to prep some cables and drill, drill a few holes in the tin and then mount it up, test it, and package it. Um, and my wife handles most of the shipping. Uh, and it's really goes, it goes pretty well. Occasionally we get, uh, you know, how this thing, if any of you work in retail, you know that predicting when demand will spike and when it won't is really hard. So <clears throat> occasionally we get, we get caught with a big wave, but otherwise it, it, it works out pretty well. So the grand total is something over 900 units. I didn't count them all, but, um, and that includes an early version where we had an external power supply um, five or six years ago, we switched over to using USB power. So that's how the preamp is powered. Last year, we shipped a total of 53 units. Uh, that included one large shipment of 20 that went to Nigeria. Um, and that was basically a foundation that wanted to distribute a lot of them to schools in Nigeria. So they arranged to take they arranged to take um, delivery in the United States, and then they they worried about getting them into Nigeria. Um, so anyhow, you know, if you subtract that out, then then it was uh, you know thirty three units or something last year. Hi. <clears throat> hey Keith. Yes, sir. Uh, real quick, um, uh, my understanding is the dragon is splashed down. Hey, um, all and, right. Uh, <laughs> then um, uh, on top of that, you got two more minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm almost done. This is, this is, this is the I've reason. got it on yeah. the uh, screen, and yes, it's down. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, so uh, this year so far, we've, uh, we've shipped 14 total, uh, a, little low, a little lower than normal, I'm sure, because of COVID. Um, most of those went to the U.S. You the one that was sent to Argentina originally, yes. too. Right. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, that one, yes, right. So we so far we've had fourteen. Um, uh, I think the mailing address on that one might have been in the United States, wasn't it, Dave? Anyhow, um, and then a couple to Canada, and then across the world. Um, not so much to uh, Africa or Asia recently, although historically we have. Now some of that is partly because of postage, I think. Um, we, we were shipping a lot, of, a lot to India, but at the moment they, sh they put a really intense import duty on anything going in from the United States, even on donations. Even if you say it's a gift, they still charge the destination, the, uh, the recipient, a big uh, import duty. And there's really no way for us, even on, like on a grant, we would ship the thing for free to them, but there's no really good way for us to pay for that duty to help them. So um, we've struggled with that some. Some countries, and including Nigeria that I mentioned earlier, have very poor delivery rates. Um, about half the devices mailed to Nigeria are returned or never delivered. Um, now that, that group of 20 went to a US address and then were hand carried to Nigeria. That's about the only way to make it work. There has been sort of a slow, steady decrease in demand, especially in the last few years. Debbie Shearer retired they lost, kind of lost funding for the outreach group uh, at Stanford. And she was a very energetic champion for Supasage. She traveled the world, 
you know, selling this idea to, to folks. And, and unfortunately, like I say, that funding went away. So she's not traveling and she's not selling them around the world. Um, and that's sort of one of the worry, one of the worries I think we have is that at some point right now, the database is hosted by Stanford and the primary supersid um, uh, website is hosted by Stanford. And I'm worried that at some point they will lose that thread and we might lose access to that. But so far, so far, so good. And we, we keep checking and they say, yes, we're gonna support it. So we're good. Um, and it's still continuing an active program. A lot of people substitute, are, are submitting data to the database. So that's the quick SuperSeed update. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, anything like that, uh, just email me at that address and I will respond as best I can. Thank you.